Hi friends, you're back again and we're so glad that you are for another exciting Vetfolio Voice episode. This episode is sponsored in part by VetraScience and features Dr. Margie Shirk, who is board certified in feline practice by the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. We focused heavily on nutrition for our feline friends as they continue to live longer and longer lives and have changing nutrition needs as they age and potentially develop conditions such as hyperthyroidism, kidney disease, etc. I'll tell you, there was a lot in here that was new information to me and much of which I've already begun passing on to pet parents with feline companions, so I hope you get a lot out of it too. Let me tell you about our wonderful guest, Dr. Shirk. Margie Shirk is a private practitioner who founded the Cats Only Veterinary Clinic in Vancouver, British Columbia in 1986. She graduated from the University of Guelph in 1982 with a DVM from the Ontario Veterinary College. As I mentioned earlier, in 1995, she became board certified in the specialty of feline practice by the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. One of the things she's most proud of is her pioneering the use of the transdermal fentanyl patch for the alleviation of pain in companion animals. She's also collaborated and co-authored several other papers and book chapters. She served on the board of the American Association of Feline Practitioners, including as president in 2007, And she's also been on the AAFP Feline Vaccine Recommendations Panel since 1995. She's volunteered on the ABVP Exam Committee and the CE Committee and served on the Scientific Advisory Committee for the World Small Animal Veterinary Congress. As a participant in the North American Veterinary Licensing Exam Committee, or the NAVLI Committee, she interacts with top teachers and practitioners to create a fair way of assessing the competence of new graduates. She also founded the Feline Internal Medicine folder on the Veterinary Information Network, and through many opportunities on the online medium, she's really grown to love teaching veterinarians, vet students, and veterinary care providers both online and in person around the world. All of this really comes out in her talk, so let's go ahead and get into it. Dr. Shirk, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. So today we're talking about nutrition in cats and cats have some unique features when it comes to their nutritional needs. What are some of these unique features of cat nutrition, feline nutrition? Well, you know, cats are designed to eat small birds and mice. And as a consequence, it means that they are designed to eat a huge amount of protein. And, uh, you know, because a, a bird or a mouse is essentially Uh, about 80% water. And then of the energy requirements, they get about 52% of the energy is protein, about 36% of the energy is fat, and about 12% of the energy they get is carbohydrate. But um, they also have, they also have some Uh, nutrients that are essential to them, namely um, the three amino acids that are really easy to remember because they spell cat, carnitine, arginine, and taurine. They are essential for cats and uh, that that they get those. Also uh, vitamin A and vitamin D. And then uh, arachidonic acid is another thing that they can't manufacture themselves from other things. So this really high need for protein um, is actually, it's kind of weird, but it's similar to mink and predatory fish. I guess that means piranhas. I don't know, but yeah. Cats and piranhas, who knew? Cats and pr- You know, I always knew there was a link. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those things that kept you kept you awake all night wondering about it, right? It did. I mean, if you yeah. ever have one that gets really mad at you, you know, there there's a go. connection there. <laughs> there you go. They can call them piranhas for a reason. Anyway, no, they're not piranhas. Let's let's set this straight right at the at the get go. <laughs> this that they're they're they are self defensive. They are not aggressive. That's very important to recognize with cats is that because they are prey animals, they're being self defensive. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll give give them the benefit there that you know that especially in a clinic when they're in a new place and it's it's new and scary and lots of smells and sounds and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we talked about the amino acids, vitamin A and D, arachidonic acid. Anything else that's unique about feline nutrition in particular? Well, if you or I were to eat this much protein, I mean, which one it does, I guess, on a, on a keto type diet, if you go to the extreme of that, 
we can actually get into, uh, uh, we become ketotic, um, as would dogs uh, become ketotic, but cats can tolerate, um, they, they have a minimal amount of protein that they require, and then their maximum is very, very flexible, It's uh, as opposed to us where there is a maximum. Um, it, with cats, they can adjust to some degree to a lower protein, but then they need more fat in their diet. And as far as carbohydrates go, carbohydrates don't aren't bad for cats, but there is a ceiling to the amount that they uh, should be getting of carbohydrates. And it's really interesting because they, uh, when you think about how a cat is designed, uh, both from an anatomic as well as a physiologic uh, perspective, they, and even a sensory perspective, they are designed to not lean towards they don't they don't need their sugar fix the way I do they um uh, they don't in fact uh, don't have the the pair of genes required to um sense sweet so there's a sensory adaptation both their um uh in the saliva and in the pancreas they don't make much amylase compared to dogs or us uh, again to break down carbohydrates and then they have a very low intestinal glucose uptake so they are um you know they're not designed to do sugar per se um uh, they in fact their liver also has a different um sugar breakdown enzyme hexokinase so um that's that's uh, of importance they also um eat have a different pattern in, in eating than we've assumed we you know have always or traditionally fed them, you know, breakfast and dinner kind of thing, and maybe a little bit to nosh throughout the day. And the little bit to nosh throughout the day is actually the way they eat, because when you catch a bird or a mouse, you, uh, it's a small bird, so you can't bring it home and carve it up as turkey dinner for, for the whole family. It's for you and that's it. And in fact, it's only about 35 calories uh, a mouse and as a of digestible energy. As a consequence, that means if a cat needs roughly 50 kilocalories per kilogram body weight per day, that means a five kilogram cat needs approximately 250 kilograms, which is about eight mice. And that means that you have to keep hunting mice and there's going to be periods in between successful kills where you don't get food. And um, uh, as a consequence, um, you have to hunt continuously, which means their drive to hunt is permanently on, which is why we need to feed them through food puzzles as opposed to uh, as opposed to using bowls so that they can actually have to hunt and work for their food, which is the native way uh, for them to do it. I love that breakdown. I mean, we know that that they're obligate carnivores and they have, you know, they're driven to hunt and all of these things, but I feel like you just broke it down in such a practical way that it gives us a little bit understanding than that really high overview of, well, you know, they have, they, they need a lot of protein. They're obligate carnivores. So thank you for that. Oh, pleasure. May I just add one more thing about of the uh, about the feeding uh, puzzles and the, and the way they eat. Remember too, that it's not, you know, they, they don't just walk outside and, and kill something and eat it. They have to hunt. They have to, and that, and it takes about 10 to 15 attempts to be successful. So if you're, let's say that you're a cat who needs eight meals um, and you're a really good hunter. So that's, so your every 10th attempt is successful. That's 80 attempts. That's a lot of exercise and planning and strategy and tactics to change on the fly uh, and uh, pun not intended. And so that you are, they, they have to work uh, really hard and uh, to get their food. And that keeps them not only fit, it also keeps them mentally fit and lower stress, just like us, exercise reduces stress. And we're now aware of how much stress our, our cats are experiencing, um, not just when we take them into the veterinary clinic, but also just at, at home because they aren't, um, they got nothing to do. And uh, it's, it's really boring. And that can result in idiopathic cystitis or um, inflammatory bowel disease or lower airway disease, et cetera. I feel like it explains a lot of the obesity that we see as well. 100%. Interesting. Not, not only is you know, the obesity because they're, they've got nothing else to do but eat and they've got this endless supply of, of calorically dense, um, delicious food, but it's, uh, you know, whether it's canned or dry, it's just the dry, there's more, more uh, power to each piece than there is with canned. And so it's, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's not just what we feed, it's how we feed that makes, make, that contributes to obesity and well-being. 
Interesting. Interesting. What about senior cats in particular? How do their dietary needs change as they get older? Well, let's start by defining senior. Um, I kind of uh, object to this a little, but that's personal, <laughs> not professional, that they're considering that a uh, ten, uh, the, the AAFP and AHA feline life stage guidelines uh, that were just published earlier this year define um, a senior cat as being 10 years of age and up. And uh, But that's, uh, that's actually okay because in the past, the, the, the older cats were called super seniors. So senior is fine. Um, and, and like uh, like us and dogs, until about 11 or 12 years of age, cat for cats, obviously not that young for us, older uh, dogs and people uh, are likely to become overweight or obese because our metabolic energy requirements decrease. And the same thing happens to cats, as I say, up until about 11 or 12 years of age. But unlike um, dogs or us, cats need more energy after 11 or 12 years of age. And it's that's why we see so many skinny old cats. And these uh, the increased energy requirement may be a result of the decreased ability to digest fat and protein, um, it's, uh, which has been shown in some studies. Uh, as, and because of that, these nutrients have to be really biologically available to them. Um, so, it, you know, given that they have these, this need for these particular CAT uh, proteins, uh, amino acids, and have this inherently high need for protein, it actually, um, older cats actually need more protein than uh, before. Older cats need more protein. I feel like that's counter to what we hear so many times because we think about kidney disease in right. older cats and me having a harder time with the protein. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, happy to. So let me, let me just back up here for a second. There's a couple of other, other things in, in senior cats. And that is that, um, you know, we know from doing DEXA studies, which is do x-ray absorptiometry, where you can see the, the, the proportions of fat and muscle and uh, uh, water, moisture, um, components of the body. Um, uh, Dr. Dottie Laflamme showed in a couple of studies uh, using that uh, methodology, instead of the traditional way of looking at nitrogen balance, which means digestibility, how much of the nitrogen that goes in comes out in the feces, what that's the traditional way of figuring out protein requirement. What she did instead was using this DEXA technology, she looked to see at, at what how much protein did cats need to maintain their lean muscle mass. And she found that it was a lot more than we thought. And that's really important because all older creatures will develop sarcopenia. I'm noticing it in myself. I'm starting to have muscle wasting. It's much harder for me to build muscle. Um, so all I'm trying to do is maintain muscle at, at, at my ripe old age. And as a, as a consequence with sarcopenia, this muscle mass decreasing is, is problematic because this is, this is different than cachexia, which is disease related. Sarcopenia is, is a normal age related muscle decrease, decline in muscle. And the issue there is that as body condition and muscle condition decrease, uh, morbidity and mortality increase. And we've known this for a long time. And this is one of the reasons why following trends in in um, lots of things in your be it your creatinine or your BUN or your um, uh, whatever you, you, you want to think of SDMA, your hematocrit, whatever it is. But especially also body weight, you know, just getting the cat on the scale every single time they're in and doing a body condition score and muscle condition score, those, uh, as those look at the trends of those, as those decline, um, that's what, you know, you know that problems are happening. And those things will change, like your body and muscle condition score and weight will decrease um, uh, as, as long as, or between two and three years before we even see increases in, for instance, creatinine or, on, and BUN. And that's something that um, Dr. Lisa uh, Freeman showed. So it's really important to mo moderate that. Anyway, so you know, chronic kidney disease. Back to your question, uh, certainly uh, impacts uh, huge numbers of cats. Uh, it may be forty percent of senior cats. And the International Renal Interest Society, or IRIS, um, is recommending that we determine treatment based on the stage of disease and the, uh, as well as the presence of specific um, conditions such as you know hypertension, pyelonephritis, nephrolithiasis. Uh, 
uh, that sort of thing. And renal diets are absolutely a good thing, but with renal, because renal diets are do a lot more than reduce protein in order to reduce phosphorus, because that's what the decreased proteins about is to reduce phosphorus. There's nothing inherently wrong with protein per se, but they it's the phosphorus restriction. They're also alkalinizing. They may have increased protein. They may be more calorically dense. Some of them contain fatty acids and antioxidants, which is all great um, and all very, very important. But the whole goal of uh, dietary therapy in chronic kidney disease is to provide complete nutrition and to address metabolic changes uh, induced by uh, by disease and to uh, including the clinical signs and consequences of uremic toxicity and hopefully to slow the progression. But there is no evidence to show that starting a renal diet before stage three um, is, is beneficial. And uh, so if you want to feed a renal diet, then you have to follow body condition score, muscle condition score, and weight to see whether this diet is in fact providing the cat with everything they need. And if it's not, then maybe add another diet with higher protein and start them on an intestinal phosphate binder because it's we, we need to tie up the phosphorus is the issue here. Um, so I'm not saying you shouldn't use a renal diet, but you need to make sure that it's actually working for the cat. And the analogy I like to use for all of these conditions where we have these wonderful prescription diets designed to um, provide complete and balanced nutrition and address particular issues, the, um, it may, you know, maybe the best diet in the world, but it may not work for me. So it's like, if I find a dress online that I think looks really, really nice. Um, and I, and it arrives at my home, you know, I order it arrives at my home and I try it on and it looks dreadful. Is that the diet's fault? No. Or the dress's fault? No. Is that my fault? No. It's just the two really don't work together. So this is why anytime you put somebody on a renal diet or a diet for whatever condition, you need to recheck them just as you would recheck after putting them on medication for, let's say, some amlodipine for hypertension or telmosartan for hypertension, and you get them back in to check their blood pressure. Same thing with the diet. You need to get them back in and see how does that how does that dress look on them? How does that diet work for them? So that's a really important to do. I love that you put out that alternative there of putting them on a higher protein diet and a phosphorus binder. That makes a lot of sense because that is a struggle. I know I've definitely seen it many, many times in my own patients, cats on kidney diet always, you know, sometimes I drag my feet a little bit because I'm like, oh, you know, I don't want you to lose weight on this diet. So to, to know that these diets are beneficial, but if, like you said, they're not working for that individual patient, I, I like that idea as an alternative to still be able to control their phosphorus, but not lose all of their muscle mass and everything like that. Yeah. And it's, and the earlier, the better, because it's hard, really hard to regrow that muscle once it's, okay. once it's lost. Um, and that's also why in, I like to use esophagostomy tubes short term in these cats to build them up. So it might be, you know, for, I'll tell the client, this is for um, six to eight weeks and it may be a bit longer. I don't know, but to try and get some muscle back on them so that we can get more, more protein calories, more calories into them. Because oftentimes these cats also have decreased appetite. And even though the pet food companies work very, very hard to make the diet extreme, the, the renal diets extremely palatable. It's sometimes hard for these cats to take in the, the appropriate quantity, which again comes back to us calculating and communicating, calculating how much exactly how much food they're going to need to gain weight gain weight. Um, and that, uh, so that the calories and, and convert that into quantity is that how much, how many grams is that? And grams is always more accurate than using cups, uh, volumetric, but especially when it comes to dry food, um, cause of all the airspace. Sure. But so that's, so that's, a uh, that's, we really need to communicate that to the client exactly. And then the client can tell us, yeah, he likes it, but he's not eating all of it. And that then helps you understand why he's losing weight, as opposed to you're assuming that something else is going on or, or his kidney disease is way worse than it is. Um, so it, it, if you know that eh, he's just not getting enough food, Right. And then you can make those adjustments. Yeah. I, I'm always interested in these, these chronic kidney disease cats because they can be really hard to manage from a lot of different 
aspects, but kind of, you know, going back to cats as a whole, can you talk about some of the other conditions that they get that can be impacted by nutrition? Sure. And I just want to also mention the newest research on, on phosphorus is that it's not all phosphoruses are, are created equal. And it appears as if the inorganic phosphorus is the, is the, is the problem. Um, so that's, you know, stay tuned. I'm sure that that's going to change therefore cha try to change some diets in, in that way. Um, if they can put more organic phosphorus and less inorganic phosphorus into the diets. Okay. Um, so, so that's, that's useful. And well, by the time we see the phosphorus phosphorus increase, it's already gone on quite some time. We'd be better off to measure PTH, but as you know, measuring a PTH is pretty cost prohibitive. And so, and it's uh, even better than that would be to measure FGF uh, 23, which is a phosphatonin because it goes up before the PTH, before the phosphorus. But right now I don't know which, if there's any labs in North America that are running that or not, but it's not a difficult test. So we need to encourage our labs to run FGF 23. But back to your question, senior <laughs> cats as a whole. There as a group. So, um, you know, we've got all these different conditions. We've, you know, talked about um, kidney disease. There's also hyperthyroidism, diabetes mellitus, you know, osteoarthritis, cognitive dysfunction. And then, you know, because because all cats, but especially older cats get dental disease, periodontal diseases is more prevalent in, or perhaps more severe in, in our older cats. When it comes to hyperthyroidism and diabetes, we can kind of lump them together because it's really easy to consider hyperthyroidism as a hypermetabolic condition, but so is diabetes because you're kind of spinning your wheels. You may be eating tons, but it's not getting into you. So it's, it's really a hypermetabolic condition. And in both cases, according to you know, Dr. Mark Peterson, who is the god of hyperthyroidism in, in cats. I mean, there's nobody in the world who knows more about it than he does, or has treated more cats. He, he recommends feeding uh, uh, diets that are at the higher end of protein with moderate fat and lower carbs. So really like a diabetes uh, uh, diet. Also, because they're you know, another reason to feed the lower carbohydrate diet to the hyperthyroid cats is they are already insulin resistant. And, you know, I, many of us have noted cats who are hyperthyroid may then also develop concurrent diabetes. Uh, and that's, you know, presumably the link there. Uh, additionally, with cats with hyperthyroidism, you've got to really pay attention to their, their phosphorus levels uh, as well, just like kidney diets, because a lot of these hyperthyroid cats are masking chronic kidney disease too. That is, sorry, I'm absorbing that for a minute with the, the concurrent diabetes and hyperthyroidism and the relationship between the two. I don't know that I've ever considered them in that way. Yeah, they and, and diabetes can be harder to diagnose in a hyperthyroid cat. Again, because they're hypermetabolic, it means that their fructosamine levels won't be as elevated as in a non-hyperthyroid diabetic cat because fructosamine, fructosamine, it is a protein-bound sugar, right? So if they're going churning through their protein so much, then they won't have their fructosamines won't be as, as high, despite the fact that they have diabetes as well. So it can be a little harder to, to diagnose. Interesting. Interesting. What about cognitive dysfunction? I mean, this is a really challenging thing to treat in any patient because like many things, every patient will respond differently and some, you know, really don't give us much of a response. So what role does diet play with cognitive dysfunction? Well, that's a really good question. Additionally, it's hard to make the diagnosis of cognitive dysfunction. Right. It's really an, an, a diagnosis of exclusion because we're not going to be doing MRIs or whatever it is they do to look for the fibrils in, you know, in, in the brain. So it's, um, you, you know, we have to really look at the big picture of, of ruling out hyperthyroidism. It's really comes down to like nighttime yowling. What are the differentials for nighttime yowling? It's hyperthyroidism or hypertension, which are readily diagnosed more or less and treated, <laughs> uh, pain, you know, assume it's there or treat for it. And then, uh, and then, um, uh, see if there's, there's a difference, uh, de decline in, sen in special senses. So vision and, and hearing, uh, they can't hear you going to bed. So they're calling after you. They can't see. So throw in some night lights, um, you know, around the house, uh, that, that come on when it gets dark. And then if all of those things have been ruled out, then you can look to cognitive dysfunction, at least as far as the nighttime yowling, but these cats, you know, maybe sitting and staring at the corner and, who knows what, 
but we need to modify their environment uh, so that their key resources are very readily available. Uh, you know, that's food, water, litter boxes, perching spots, sleeping spots. They may need ramps or, or stairs. They may, may need their litter boxes. The edges cut lower so they can get in and out of them more readily without having to do hurdles, like climb a hurdle. If you think about it, the height of a litter box is about the same length as their legs are. So imagine if for us to go to the bathroom, you always had to climb something that was, you know, at, up to your crotch to get over <laughs> the edge, to get into the litter box or to get into the bathroom would be a little um, problematic if you have- Make you wonder, this. like, is it worth it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe I'll just go right here. Exactly. Hey, I mean, that, right that kind of That's gives you there. a whole new perspective on going That's... outside of the litter box with these guys. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So those edges, you know, need to be cut down and the boxes really need to be big because, um, uh, you know, like about one and a half times the length of a cat, but that's in general, that's not just, uh, you know, Commercial litter boxes are not designed for cats. I'm not sure what they're designed for. Maybe <laughs> plants, I don't know. But they're far too small for cats. Anyways, that's a whole nother, nother, nother uh, conversation. Regarding nutrition for these guys, um, there isn't a whole heck of a lot studied, but one study showed that cats upward of middle age, when they were given fish oil, antioxidants, arginine and some B vitamins that that enhanced brain functions. And then there was an earlier study that looked at um, increased, showed increased activity in elderly cats who received antioxidants. Again, L-carnitine, um, docos, uh, docosohexanoic acid, I can never pronounce that, and sulfur amino acids. So that one's interesting too. And then we also know that um, products that include uh, ingredients that support calming and relaxation may be worth considering because since 2007, we've known that alpha casozepine, um, which is a milk protein, reduces anxiety in cats and that it's been incorporated into several diets along with tryptophan. You know, you think about, uh, uh, there's a couple of diet, commercial diets out there uh, that are designed this way to help reduce anxiety and stress. And L-theanine may also be very beneficial for this too. I feel like once we get this recorded and, and put out there, I'm definitely going to go back and listen in particular <laughs> to that part because cognitive dysfunction and trying to manage that and work with a client on a cat with cognitive dysfunction, you can feel so helpless for like, oh, I just don't know how to how to make the, you know, how to make things better for this cat and this, uh, this oh, pet parent. Yeah. And um, so I, that was just a wealth of information for cognitive dysfunction. Awesome. What about uh, periodontal disease? That's another thing we deal with, uh, you know, especially in older For cats. Sure. And sometimes they have concurrent things going on that make anesthesia not as appealing. For sure. Well, and, and as far as anesthesia goes, you know, you can certainly perform safe anesthesia uh, very readily on older cats uh, with appropriate uh, pre-anesthetic care and workup. We, but I, I just consider, you know, periodontal disease as really part of uh, chronic inflammatory conditions. Uh, and because with periodontal disease in, in cats, we don't actually have evidence that it causes kidney disease or that it causes heart disease. It, interesting, there was one study that showed that where it, they looked at it the other way around to see whether cats with chronic kidney disease, what else did they have and had, uh, and had they been anesthetized for anything and had they um, had cystitis or whatever. And it turns out that cats, that the, there were important pairings between cats who had periodontal disease preceding the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, cats who had had an anesthetic for anything preceding the diagnosis and cats who had um, cystitis preceding the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, um, that, that those were at higher prevalence. But again, that's, that's association, not causation. With respect to periodontal disease, though, in any chronic inflammatory condition, supporting the antioxidant cascade is really helpful. And the reason I, I say antioxidant cascade is you don't want to just use a single antioxidant because there's actually a chain reaction. It's kind of like if you think of like watch inside a watch, the cogs um, or 
a, a digital, or pardon me, an analog watch where the cogs intertwine with, with each other. And so you have uh, like vitamin E starts off and it disarms the free radicals and then coenzyme Q10 recycles the vitamin E. And then that's followed by hooks into vitamin C, which also recycles vitamin E. And then beta carotene recycles vitamin C. And then glutathione is, is recycled by other substances. So it's so it all links together. So using a bunch of them together is really useful. Sure. We talked a little bit earlier about sarcopenia. Can we talk about dietary management and sarcopenia a little bit more? And I know in these older guys, you know, we're losing muscle mass. Sometimes there's osteoarthritis going on. Can we talk a little bit more about how to manage those conditions that may be going on concurrently? Sure. So uh, with osteoarthritis, we know, you know, there's certainly um, a couple of diets available and we know that omega-3 fatty acids, especially from fish oil, may be beneficial uh, if somebody is obese, uh, getting some weight off. So that includes some L-carnitine in their diet. That would be very helpful. But of course, that's e a lot easier said than done. Um, one peer-reviewed paper by, you know, Dr. Duncan LaSalle's uh, showed that there was a benefit in mobility in cats who were receiving a diet that was supplemented with fish oil, uh, green-lipped muscle extract, a glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. And then there was also an unpublished study uh, that was presented as an abstract um, a few years earlier that showed nutritional benefit uh, if these uh, osteoarthritic cats, older osteoarthritic cats were supplemented with vitamin C and E and beta carotene, omega-3 fatty acids, um, methionine, glucosamine, and chondroitin sulfate as chondroprotectants, and L-carnitine and lysine to encourage weight loss and muscle maintenance. But beyond that, unfortunately, there are no published studies actually supporting the use of nutraceuticals for osteoarthritis. That said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So, you know, we, I, I, I still think it's a, a good idea to use these. However, if a client and a cat are willing to only, I like to think of clients as coming in with three eggs in a basket and those three eggs are their budget. It's their budget and they've got a financial budget. They have a time budget and they have an emotional budget you know, about how much are they willing to upset, cause upset in their cat. And so when, when people say, well, you know, eh, it doesn't do any harm, it might, you know, um, I'm not saying not to use these at all, but what I'm saying is that you need to use those things that we have absolute evidence for first. And then if, you know, if the, per, if the, if the money, the time and the emotional budget is there, absolutely. Let's, let's do these other things too. Is, and how does that play into cachexia? You know, we talked a little bit about sarcopenia, but cachexia being a more pathological process, are those treated similarly or can either one of them be managed with dietary therapy? Well, sarcopenia, some ways it can be managed uh, nutritionally, but it, you know, it's certainly in people, resistance training is recommended. And I'm not quite sure how you're going to do that with cats, but you know, the resistance training tells me. I would maintain, love to see it though. <laughs> I would love to see it. Yeah. Didn't Kleban, or is that what his name, Kleban, the, the uh, uh, artist uh, show, you know, cats in little training weights, um, but <laughs> wrist weights, you know, that, that maintains muscle and it stimulates the osteoblast to help uh, make your bones strong. But cachexia, on the other hand, it's loss of lean mass um, affecting cats with congestive heart failure or chronic kidney disease or cancer. And that, that's, that's definitely uh, pathological. Sometimes they occur uh, concurrently, of course, because you've got normal age-related loss and then you have a condition on top of that. But there's not a lot that you know, we, can, we can do for cachexia, unfortunately. Um, but sarcopenia, focus on the dietary protein and of course, monitor phosphorus or use intestinal phosphate binders. So talking about a senior cat in general, we talked about how their needs change as they get older, but how in particular would you address feeding a senior cat? Well, you got to start with a nutritional assessment. And that sounds like to me, even though I'm, I'm really keen on every, every cat, every time and think uh, it still sounds pretty boring or like, uh, I don't have time for it. You know, it sounds like too much to do. It actually is pretty simple and that we're, we are essentially already doing these things, but we're not making note of them. So there, the, there's three components to the nutritional assessment. You've got to get an accurate diet history and, you know, there's a you know wonderful form on the 
World Small Animal Veterinary Association or WSAVA Global Nutrition Toolkit, it's WSAVA.org, to help determine the exact brands and amounts that are being fed, um, as well as uh, the uh, fed and consumed, because there may be two different things. God knows I scrape enough food into the into my green bin um, that the cats decide not to eat, as well as treats and supplements, because I always forget to ask about treats and supplements. So I have that on my checklist specifically to make, to remind myself. So, and, and, you know, that's not difficult if a client can't remember, oh, it's the blue bag. It's, you know, it's the little triangles in the blue bag that, you know, that, that I'm feeding him. Well, you know, the one I mean, you know, the one I mean. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, what are you feeding? Oh, what is it? Yeah. And the, exactly that, you know, it's, it's about yay big and it's, yeah. it's like a light. And it has a color. cat on the There's front. There's a cat on the front. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, then if you it, it just, every, you know, pretty much everybody's got a smartphone now and if they can just take photos and, and uh, text it to you once they get home and, and they can also look and, and take a measure. If they use a scoop, they can actually take that scoop and put it into a measuring cup so that you can actually, or take the scoop of, of if it's dry, food and put it on top of their on top of their kitchen or postal scale then we can actually get some quantities accurately so that's really really helpful and the second thing we have to do so first we have to find out what's being offered offered and, and eaten the second thing we've got to do is how's the cat being fed is the cat being fed twice daily is the cat being fed every you know every half hour is the cat you know what what's going on here and do they use bowls or do they use feeding puzzles um what's the routine who does it does the cat you know somebody gets up in the morning and feeds the cat and then goes has a, has a shower or is it uh, you know is it uh, is grandma home all day long and she feeds the feeds the cat all day long or whatever and are there other um, critters who might be stealing the food so you don't really know what's what's going on is is the cat fed on the counter on the bookshelf wherever and then the third thing in the clinic is getting a weight it's uh, it's quite remarkable there was a fantastic study done out of the University of Guelph uh, a couple of years ago where they got something like 19 million medical records and of cats and found that uh, uh, fewer than 51% had even a single body weight in them. Really? Mind blowing. A single body weight. Mind blowing. Wow. So it's, yeah. So, I mean, just get a body weight at every visit. You know, if they come in for the nails trim, get a body weight, plop them on the scale, get a body weight, get a body weight, and then uh, perform and record a body condition score and a muscle condition score. Um, really important to do. And of course, because the body condition score and muscle condition score are two different things. The body condition score tells you if the cat's getting too few too many or the right amount of calories. And whereas the protein, uh, uh, pardon me, the uh, muscle condition score tells you whether the cat is how, how much uh, protein they're taking, uh, how much protein they're maintaining because it's looking at lean mass. And both body and muscle condition scores can also be found at the WSAVA um, Global Nutrition Toolkit. And it's really important. And again, looking at trends, and that's why I like to do a percentage weight change, because oftentimes if it's, let's say, half a kilo or, you know, or maybe even less than that, say three quarters of a pound or something, uh, weight loss or weight gain, we may think, oh, it's not much, you know, but when you actually convert that to your, as a percentage to what it would look like on a person, which I do, you know, if a person's not looking shocked when I say it's 10%, you know, and then I'll say, well, that's, you know, that that's, um, you know, 13 pounds on me, they think I get, whoa, yeah, that could be problematic if that keeps on going every six months or, you know, getting, uh, losing or gaining that amount. So that's um, useful. And so that's, so that's the, uh, you know, those are the, the, really the, the three components, getting an accurate dietary history, find out exactly how, and, you know, how the cat's being fed and then getting body weight, muscle and body condition scores. And yeah. So then we, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, you also have to make sure that how that, as I said before, try the dress on, how that, how that, um, you know, recheck the cat because it is a prescription. Um, you need to see how the cat's doing on that diet. Does it actually work uh, on that cat? So you have to calculate and the amount of calories and protein that they need, record it in the record, 
convert it into quantity of diet and communicate it to the to the client. And as far as that goes, you, know, you think, oh gosh, that seems like a lot of work too. But there's a there's a good website, um, vetcalculators.com, that will help you with calories. I'd love to say Pet Nutrition Alliance because I've been part of that. But Pet Nutrition Alliance's calculator is only for obese cats, whereas vetcalculators.com is also, and it allows you in to input the type of food they're eating as well, so you can figure out how much they should be getting. Oh, yes. I've definitely spent some time with those calculators here and there. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that because um, most people don't, don't, uh, or many people don't, uh, don't know of them or don't use them uh, because they just don't, can't, they're too busy and they don't see it as a high enough priority. But that's you know, why we're rules. here is getting that information out there. So exactly. they know where to look Yay. for it. <laughs> yeah. So for pro- protein, cats need about between five to 5.4 grams of protein per kilogram ideal weight per day. So five to 5.4 grams of, of protein per kilogram ideal weight per day. Okay. So that's, it's a, it's important to not just say per kilo, uh, just for their existing weight, it's their ideal weight. And I think you touched on this a little bit just now, but when you are talking to the pet parents about these kinds of issues, do you have any tips and tricks for communicating all of this with pet parents? Yeah. Take it. Don't, don't be in a rush. Don't be in a rush. Um, you know, we like to do things quickly. And this is a very fast paced society and, and we like to see results quickly, but this is for instance, with, let's say we're transitioning somebody to a renal diet or to a GI diet or whatever it might be, or to a weight loss diet. Don't do it. Don't try and do it overnight or even over two weeks. Take, you know, plan that it's going to take about a month and it probably won't. So, you know, that we're going to do, because you have to negotiate with cats. You can't simply put the food down and say, eat this because a cat would, you know, rather starve and walk away. They're not like dogs. They're, you know, they're going to, they're far more strong-willed, I guess, in that way. But so you're going to put down 10% of the new um, it with 90% of the old, and then you're going to put down, you know, uh, in a couple of days, if they're eating that 20% of the new and 80% of the old and a few days later, but not right the next day, you know, you want them to get comfortable with it, not feel like you're pulling some trick on them, even though you are, and then 30%, 70%, and then you 40%, 60%. And it may be that at, at 40%, 60%, 40% of new and 60% of their old food that the cat says, yep, yeah, not going past that not going to eat it, then you're better off to feed 40% of the prescription diet and 60% of the old diet than not nothing of the prescription diet. So it's, I think it's important to realize that, that, you know, that's where the negotiation comes in. That may be as far as you get, but that's better than not getting any of the prescription diet. And ultimately the, the pet food companies hate me saying this, but ultimately it's better that they eat than what they eat. Sure, sure. But don't that default to that some... too soon. Don't right, default right. to that too soon. Give it Engage some in negotiation first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, anything else you'd like to share with us with regard to feeding senior cats? Well, you know, there's a lot of inflammation. There's uh, often pain involved and dehydration. You think about how many of our older cats come in dehydrated and, you know, you run some bloods on them. They've got metabolic acidosis. So, let me ask you, what does dehydration plus metabolic acidosis look like in a person? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure I'm you've never that. experienced it. It's a, it's a hangover. I was going to say, is it a hangover? There it you go. Like a hangover. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's a hangover. Now, um, I'm sure you've known somebody who's experienced a hangover and, um, not, not me though. I'm, no, not, yes, not me, I've course. seen, I've seen, of course, so. of course you've seen it though. <laughs> you've seen it and it's not pleasant. And now just imagine instead of having a hangover for six hours or 12 hours, having it day oh after day, after week, after month from my, my friend who I've seen experience. Yes. This, that sounds awful. <laughs> It sounds, sounds, sounds unbelievable. And yet we see dehydration and metabolic acidosis every day of the week. And, and because of that, you know, uh, because of that, it's so unbelievably important to focus on hydration, nutrition, analgesia, and reducing stress. Those are to me are the four keys before jumping to make a diagnosis and get something written in the medical record, pancreatitis or something, you know, it doesn't, the body's designed to heal itself. And so if we, if we support those things that the body can work on, namely hydration by doing hydration, nutrition, analgesia, and reducing stress, 
by meeting environmental and behavioral needs, then the body can do those things and can fix itself. And then, you know, if, if that's not enough, we can add this medication or that medication where the pharmaceutical companies are really going to love me. Um, but it's, you know, those are the, those are the four, four keys really. And you think about like an inflammation, what's inflammation, it's pain, it's swelling. There's inevitably dehydration because of the edema and dehydration elsewhere. And inflammation can cause uh, anywhere in the gut can cause ileus. Uh, anywhere in the in the abdomen can cause ileus, and so instead of you know hitting them with a pro motility agent, let's deal with the pain. Let's deal with an give them an analgesic agent, um, not an opioid because that slows down their guts even further. But you know maybe an NSAID or or the like. And I'm you're absolutely fine to use NSAIDs with cats with chronic kidney disease. You just have to use really really low doses, um, not the doses on the on the label. I mean, these need to be a lot lower than that. So yeah, focus on those and we reduce the causes of, of ileus by reducing pain, reduce inaptance because things are moving through and improve quality of life. And please, you know, please, please, please don't offer new diets in the clinic. They need to be offered in a situation where the cat feels less stressed and more, more uh, comfortable um, and not and not as ill. I mean, deal with a illness and and then change the diet at home. Because as I you know I mentioned inappetence earlier, um, it's uh, and it's a real problem in the progression of any illness. Of course, we've got appetite stimulants and 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 B twelve. You know, we've got, but we should also consider the palatability. You know, maybe try. I've tried everything, doctor. Can you tell me exactly what you've tried? Because chances are there are more diets out there. But you know, bowl shape and and where the bowls are. Maybe the bowl is placed in a is, is placed too near where the dog is or another cat is. Or maybe it's uh, maybe if you put it on on a little stool, it would be easier for them. Or simple things like simple things like that. Um, some you know sometimes adding a probiotic or symbiotic uh, that has digest in it may improve the palatability. And, you know, certainly I'll, I'll, I will say, you know, one thing is that, you know, the, the VetraScience um, supplements, uh, which VetraScience very kindly sent me some, my cats love them. So they're certainly palatable. Uh, no question about that. I mentioned earlier being proactive with short-term feeding tubes. It can really, it can really save lives and slow the progression of disease too. But kitties got to enjoy their food, whatever focus on that. That's the bottom line. Keep them eating. That's the bottom line. Keep them eating. Yep. Keep them eating. This has been just a fantastic conversation. I was like jotting notes to myself to remember to address in my own Pleased to see. I was pleased to see. (laughs) Yeah. I have like my little list here. I'm like, okay, these things I need to go back over because I know I, I can think of specific patients that can benefit and how I can be doing a better job with them. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I hope you guys enjoyed that and are as excited as I have been to take that information back to your patients so we can do even more for our senior cats. Thank you so much, Dr. Shirk, for joining us and providing all this wonderful information. And thank you, VetraScience, for sponsoring this episode. To learn more about VetraScience and their vet-exclusive line of supplements, please visit VetraProLine.com for more information. That's V-E-T-R-I-P-R-O-L-I-N-E dot com. If you'd like to find more episodes like this, click on the education tab on the Vetfolio webpage. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this session, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.